Hello, welcome to Sigma Tech Learning Hub. I will be your instructor for chemistry. For this class, we are going to be taking our exercises from the exam guide app. If you don't have the application already installed on your device or on your phone, I will want you to download the app in order to follow along in this class. Exam Guide is a leading educational app that helps students prepare adequately for various exams like UTME, Post-UTME, WIAC, GCE, KCPE, IJMB, JUPEP, Calvetpedia, BECE, JSCE, NCEE, NECO, etc. You can download the app from www.examguide.com or Google Play Store. Please subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification bell to be updated on new videos. Ready for today's class? Okay, let's get started. Here today we'll be looking at chemical combination, part two. Chemical combination, part two. Now, I already told you that uh, why this uh, chemical combination has been achieved is because it is used in providing us a compound. It is used in providing us uh, a compound. Now, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to know how and why compounds are being formed, differences and properties between ionic and covalent bonds, similarities between ionic and covalent co compounds, rules of naming a compound, and laws of chemical combination. Now, why are compounds being formed? Compounds, why are they being formed? Atoms from chemical compounds Atoms form chemical compounds to make the outer electron more stable. To make the outer electron more stable. We know that the electron is around the atom. Okay? It is found in the outermost shell of the atom. And you already know that this is the valence orbit. Okay? And the electrons there are called the valence electrons. I told you all that in our past lessons. So this is why compounds are being formed so that that particular electron that has much energy that is being in motion every single time will be stable in essence it is going to be shared among molecules it is going to be shared from one element to another now when this is being done this is the reason why compounds are being formed so that these electrons can be stable now, how are compounds formed? How are they formed? I told you before that compounds are formed by the breakage of bonds. Okay? They break bonds. In essence, they share their electron pairs among themselves. The elements share the electron pairs among themselves. Now, compounds are formed when two elements are joined together by strong forces called chemical bond. Called chemical bond. In essence, this force is an attraction. Okay, this force is, a, is an attraction. And when the force comes, it will attract the electrons from element A and element B to join together. Now, when they join together, they form a bond called chemical bond, irrespective of the kind of compound they form. Irrespective of the kind of compound they form. They form chemical bond, and this bond will bring the formation of a compound. Now, what is a bond, first of all? A bond is a link between atoms, molecules, and ions. Any link, any attraction between atom, molecules, and ions is a bond. Any attraction, any one. Atoms and molecules come together, fine. Ions and atoms come together, fine. Molecules and ions come together, fine. Okay, that is the bond. Now, even, even in, um, in, in mixtures, bonds are being formed, even in mixtures. Okay, because the salt already is a compound. The salt is already a compound. And the water is already a compound. We are talking about salt solution. So this, these two things will come together. As the, as the water is dissolving, Okay, as the water is dissolving, in, as the salt is dissolving inside the water, the bond is being formed. How? The salt 
will combine with the water to give us a soil solution. In essence, there is a force in there, but the force is a very weak force. Basically, why? Because it is a mixture. Now, you know what a bond is? Let's know what a chemical bond is. A bond can be in a mixture and a bond can still be in a compound. But the one we are talking about here now is a compound. The bonds in a compound are called chemical bond. Now, what is a chemical bond? A chemical bond is a lasting attraction between atoms, molecules, or ions that enable the formation of a chemical compound. That lasting attraction is a force. Okay? It is the force between atoms, molecules, and ions that enable formation of a chemical compound. I told you that when the bond come together, okay, when they come together from element A and element B, okay, it might be a molecular compound, it might be an ionic compound. Any type of compound that is being formed must have this transfer of electrons, must have this attraction of electrons. Okay, I will have to transfer my own electron to the next person. The person will transfer his own to me. Now, both of us will now hug ourselves. It's like when you hug yourself. Okay, when you hug yourself, you're putting your hand around the next person. The person is putting your hand around you. In essence, that particular thing becomes a bond because there's an attraction between both of you. That is how this chemical bond are being formed, are being achieved. And when this thing is being achieved, a compound will be made. When this bond is being achieved, a compound will be made. In essence, it is a force of attraction between atom molecules and ions. That is a chemical bond. Now, there are two types of chemical bond. Okay? The, the bond, the type of bond determines the type of compound that is being made. The type of bond, the time the type of compound that is being made. In essence, the bond and the compound are the same thing. If, it's an, if it is an ionic bond, then it will give you an ionic compound. If it is a molecular bond or equivalent bond, it's going to give you a covalent uh, compound. So the bond determines the kind of compound that is being produced. Now, there are two types of chemical bond, okay? Ionic and covalent. Ionic and covalent. These are the two types of chemical bond. These are the two types of bond that create a compound. Now, differences and properties of covalent and ionic compounds. We've talked about the ionic compounds in our last uh, lesson when I talked about the chemical combination part one. So already you know what an ionic bond is. Okay, you, and you know what a covalent bond is already. You know what ionic bond is, and you know what a covalent bond is already. Because we've talked about that in our last lesson, chemical combination. Now, differences and properties of covalent and ionic bond. Now, these differences are still their properties or are still their characteristics. It is still their characteristics. This is what is making them different from each other. Okay? This is what we, we are be, this is what we know them for. This is what they, they exhibit. This is what they represent. Okay? And it says number one, covalent compounds have low melting point, while ionic compounds have high melting point. Now, the covalent compounds, we already know that covalent compounds are still called the molecular compounds. We know that. It is the transfer of molecules, you know, it's the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. So the covalent compounds have low melting point. They have low melting point because they are electrically neutral. They are neutral. In essence, they cannot have a high melting point because they're electrically neutral. Why the ionic compounds have high melting point because they are charged bodies. They are charged bodies. Remember, ionic compounds are between um, is, 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 is ionic compounds are between metals and non-metals. Why the covalent compounds are between two non-metals? So you, you already know that. So in essence, these two non-metals cannot give you a high melting point. Why? Because non-metals are basically gases. Most of them are gases, except otherwise. Okay, most of them are gases except uh, 
otherwise. Like mercury, mercury is, is a liquid at room temperature. Okay, some are gases and some are liquids. So in essence, they have a low melting uh, point. Why do any compounds have a me high melting point? Because it consists of a, a charged body and a non-metal. Any compounds we know consist of a charged body. In essence, they have been positive the ionic compounds are between metals and non-metals. These metals are positive. You know that why the non-metals are negative. In essence, they give us a compound that is ionic. So their, high, so, so their melting point is going to be high because of that positivity in the ionic compound. Now, covalent compounds have low boiling point, whereas the ionic compounds have high boiling point. But before then, ionic compounds are being characterized by the melting point. Ionic compounds are being known by the melting point because they have high melting point. Everything about them is high. Everything about them is high because of the charges. Because of the charges. Now, covalent compounds have low boiling point. Yes, they have very, a very low boiling point because they are electrically neutral, like I said. They are electrically neutral. So their boiling will not be high as that of the ionic compounds. Compounds that are covalent have low polarity, while compounds that are ionic have high uh, polarity. I told you what polarity is. Okay, the transfer of electric charges from one atom to another. Already you know that. So the, their transfer of electric charges is high. It's very high. Let's take, for example, sodium chloride. Sodium is a positive charge and chlorine is a negative charge. In essence, their transfer will be very high. Why? Because there is a force of attraction. There is a force of attraction. The positive and the negative have been attracted together. So in essence, that polarity, that electric, that electric conductivity will become very high. Why in covalent compounds it is not there? Because both of them are negative. So there is no attraction. Why? Because they are like terms. You know, we, 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 we know that um, the law of magnets say like terms repel and opposite, uh, like poles repel and opposite poles attract. So it is the same law that binds these covalent ionic uh, compounds. The, the, the covalent compounds have like terms. They have like charges. So in that sense, the electricity will be very low. Why the ionic compounds have high charges, uh, opposite charges, so the electricity conduction will be very high. Now, still going to the differences, covalent compounds are formed between non-metals. Why ionic compounds are formed between metals and non-metals? Covalent compounds are formed between non-metals. Why ionic compounds are formed between metals and non-metals? between metals and non-metals. Uh, now, it is ionic because between metals and non-metals, the metal sodium, like I said, reacting with the non-metal chlorine, okay? Now, sodium has, sodium is a positive charged ion, and chlorine is a negative charged ion. I told you what an ion is already. So when both of them come together, they give us a compound. Now, compounds that are covalent consist of molecules, while any compound consists of ions. These covalent compounds consist of uh, molecules. And you know that molecules are electrically neutral, same as the atom. Okay? They are electrically neutral. So in essence, the compound that this covalent bond will, be f will, will, will give us is going to be an electrically neutral compound. While ionic compound consists of ions, the ionic compound is going to give us charged bodies. It's going to give us charged ions. Why? Because it is an electrovalent uh, combination. Remember, the ionic compounds or the ionic bond is still called electrovalent bond. Electro means electrons, valent means together. So electrons coming together forms this uh, compound. Now, covalent compounds do not conduct electricity. But ionic compounds do in aqueous form. In essence, when these compounds that are ionic, 
Okay, when it's coming at an ionic in aqueous form, aqueous means what I told you of aqueous solution, a solution where the solvent is water. In essence, if these ionic compounds are in aqueous form, they are going to conduct electricity. Take, for example, um, this same uh, uh, sodium chloride is a common salt. Okay, the common salt to use in the house, sodium chloride. When the sodium chloride melts, okay, when the salt melts and forms water, it is the conductor of electricity. But in the solid state, it cannot conduct electricity. Why? Because at that state, it is negative in nature. Because the positive and the negative will give us a negative. But when it turns to water, it gives us a positive charged body. Gives us a positive charged body. So in essence, when salt is melting and when salt is evaporating, in that state, it is a conductor of electricity. And I told you what a conductor is. An apparatus that allows the free flow of electrons from particle to particle. Now, the next one is the similarities between covalent and ionic compound. One, they are formed by the transfer of electrons. They are formed by the transfer of electrons. You, you, saw why, you saw why compounds are being formed, so that the electrons will be stable. Okay, so this particular uh, a co a compound, both of them are formed by transfer of electrons. I told you that when compounds are formed, there's an exchange of bond. In essence, there's, an ex there's a breakage of bond. When these bonds are broken, electrons are transferred from one element to another. And when they are transferred, they hug themselves, they come together and form a particular substance that is called a compound. And that's one says, <coughs> they have both binding energy. Yes, for force to be achieved, okay, for electrons to be broken, <coughs> for bonds to be broke, for, for bonds to be broken and electrons to be transferred, there must be an energy. Without energy, there will be no force. So in that sense, they are using their molecular energy, they are using their molecular energy in this transfer of electrons. This transfer of electrons. The next one says they both have force of attraction. Yes. The force of attraction is a bond. In essence, they both have bond together. They both have bond. The molecular, uh, uh, the covalent compounds have molecular bond or covalent bond. Why the ionic compounds have electrovalent or ionic bond. Now, they lead to the creation of a stable molecule. Yes. Both of them lead to the creation of a compound. What of them leads to the creation of a compound? They lead to the creation of a compound. Take, for example, hydrogen and oxygen. They, they gave us water, a molecule of water, stable. Sodium and chlorine gave us salt, a molecule of salt, stable. So both of them lead to the creation of a stable uh, molecule. Now, the next one we are going to see is a set of rules. There are a set of rules that enable us to create a compound set of rules that enable us to create a compound, okay? Set of rules that enable us to name, name compounds, name compounds. It is called chemical nomenclature. It's called chemical nomenclature. It's a set of rules to generate systematic names for chemical compounds. A set of rules that is set, okay? Rules that are set to generate systematic names for chemical compounds. I told you that you're going to know how to get uh, 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 names from chemical compounds. How do we derive their names when they give you the formula? How do you get their names? We are going to know, and that thing is called chemical nomenclature. Now, the next one is the rules of naming compounds. They say for covalent compounds, write the name of the first element and add the suffix "-ied", to the second element if there are two elements. Write the name, for, for covalent compounds, write the name of the first element and add the suffix "-ied", to the second element if there are two elements. Now, let's take for example, um, N, 
NACL. For example, NACL. Now, this they say write the name of the first element. This first element, Na, is sodium. Sodium. And they say to the second element, add hide to the element. Now, this is chlorine. The second one is chlorine. The second one is uh, chlorine. In essence, this element is supposed to be called sodium chlorine. But the law, according to IUPAC, IUPAC is the International Union, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry gave us the rule on how to name a compound. Now, this name is what we call sodium chlorine, but the law says you should add hide to the second element. In essence, you're going to remove the in and add the what? I'm going to move the in and add the I'd. So this element is now called sodium chloride. It's now called sodium chloride. Let's take another one. I want to bring one name that is somehow water. <laughs> water. Water. We know that water has, water has, we, okay, this is the formula for water. This is the formula for water. Okay? Now, H subscript 2O, formula for water. Now, they said you should add I to the second element. Write down the name of the first element. Now, if you check the first element, the first element has a number of atoms represented. The first element has a number of atoms represented. And that number of atoms represented is two. And according to the rule, you must have to add the name of the subscript to the element. You must have to add the subscript of the element. Now, the name of that subscript is di. Di. One is mono. Two is di, three is tri, of which we know that according to the Greek word. Now, this water now is two hydrogen. Two hydrogen means dihydrogen. Two hydrogen means dihydrogen. Now, the second element is O, oxygen. And they said you should add hyde. In essence, it's going to be oxide. It's going to be oxide. Now, you can still call it water or you call it dihydrogen oxide. Either you call it water or you call it dihydrogen uh, oxide. Now, they said for ionic compounds, the metal element comes first, then add hyde to the second metal. For ionic compound, the metal element comes first, then add hyde to the second. It's the same thing like I gave you as chlorine, as um, sodium chloride. I gave you as sodium chloride, NaCl, the same thing. Sodium chloride, NaCl, this one is sodium. Sodium is a metal, and the chlorine is a non-metal. So you just add hyde, and it gives you sodium chloride. This is the rules of how to name compounds. This is the rules of how to name uh, compounds. For the metal compounds, you just keep the first the, the metal element first and add I to the second because the second element is a non-metal. These I you're adding are to non-metals. These I you're adding are to non-metals. Now there are laws, okay, that binds compounds. There are laws that binds compounds. There are laws that bind compounds. Now, these laws that bind compounds are called the laws of chemical combination. The laws of chemical combination. Now, the first law, law of chemical, the first law there is said law of conservation of mass. The second one says law of multiple proportion. The third one says law of definite proportion. And the last one says 
law of reciprocal proportion. Now, these four laws are the laws that bind the formation of a compound. How is a compound being formed? These are the laws that bind it. Every compound that is being formed fall under these four laws. Now, the first law is the law of conservation of mass. And it states, the mass of an isolated system can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be transferred from one form to another. Now, that isolated system it simply talks about matter. Okay? They say the mass of matter, in essence, matter can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be transferred from one form to another. And this law was given to us by Antonio Laviosa. Antonio Laviosa provided this law when he saw that matter can neither be created, matter cannot be destroyed in a chemical reaction. You can't destroy it. Now, let's take for example, it can never be created or not destroyed, but can transform from one form to another. Let's take for example, okay, we have uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Okay, or let's take a very simple one that I like to use. Okay, I like to use water. Now, this one is a gas, this one is a gas, and it gave us water that is a liquid. In essence, in the reaction, okay, the gas, in the reaction, the gas was neither created, the gas was not destroyed. The hydrogen is, in the, in the chemical reaction, the hydrogen took part in the chemical reaction, the oxygen took part in the chemical reaction, they were not destroyed. Okay? Both of them kept their gaseous state. But what did they do? They had to change from their gaseous state to the liquid state. In essence, they changed from gaseous to liquid. They have been transferred from gaseous to liquid in the chemical reaction. They were not destroyed. And both of them gave us one particular thing, an isolated system. Okay? Both of them gave us one particular thing. They gave us one particular product because of their transformation. They change from gas to liquid. So that is the law of conservation of mass. Now the second one says law of multiple proportion. Law of multiple proportion was given to us by John Dalton. John Dalton gave us the law of multiple proportion. And it states, when two elements combine with each other to form a compound, the masses of one which combine with fixed with fixed mass of other bear the same whole number ratio to another. I still take again water. I still use water again. Now, this is... They say the same ratio of hydrogen will be the same ratio after the reaction. Hydrogen has two atoms before the reaction Hydrogen will have two atoms during the reaction, and hydrogen will have two atoms after the reaction. In essence, the hydrogen will remain the same. The oxygen will still remain the same. The oxygen will be one, and the hydrogen will be one. Now, after the reaction, they still give us the same thing as uh, water. They still give us two atoms of hydrogen and one molecule or one atom of oxygen. They bear the same whole number ratio. In essence, both of them has given us one thing, one whole number. Okay? If you check, the ratio in hydrogen is two. The ratio in oxygen is one. They gave us one single thing, one single thing, in the same ratio. In essence, the whole number they gave to us is water. Two particular elements formed a particular product, one thing, water. But inside the water, the ratio still remains the same. So both of them came together and formed one particular thing, which is water. So it is not because of hydrogen is two, during the reaction, it will be different. Then inside the product, it will be different. No. They all passed the same transformation, came out in the same way, and remained constant. So it is the whole number now. H subscript 2O is the whole number. Why? Because it is one product, which is uh, water. 
Now, the next one was law of definite proportion or law of constant composition. Anyone who want to call it the same thing? It was given to us by Joseph Prunt. Joseph Prunt provided this law. He said, in a particular chemical compound, all samples of that compound will be made up of the same element in the same ratio or proportion. It's as simple as ABCD. Water, 2 is to 1. In any particular chemical compound, all samples of that compound will be made up to the same element in the same ratio or proportion. Water, 2 is to what? 1. Hydrogen is 2 is to 1. Simple. In the same proportion. Even in come to, to the product, the product being formed is still 2 is to 1. So in the reaction, it was 2 is to 1. In the product, it's still the same 2 is to 1. So there's no different thing. It's still the same thing. So the last one is law of reciprocal proportion. Law of reciprocal proportion. It says, if element A combine with B and also with C, then if B and C combine together, the proportion by weight in which they do so will be related to the weight of B and C, which separately combine with the weight of A. Now, let's check. This one talks about three elements. Okay? It talks about three elements. Three elements, let's, let me take uh, hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Three elements. They said if element A combined with B and also with C, okay, then if B and C combine together, the proportion by weight in which they do so will be related to the weight of B and C, which separately combine with A. It's a very simple thing. This is the three one. They said hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen gives us H subscript 2 SO4, that is also a 6 acid. Now they said if um, they said if the B and C combine, this is A, this is B, and this is C. B and C is sulfate. Sulfate. Okay? Now, combine together. The proportion by weight will be related. The, the, they said the proportion. By weight, in which they do so, will be related to the weight of B and C, which separately combine with the weight of A. It's just the same thing. Okay? It, it's the same thing. The simple thing is H reacting with S sub 4 will give us H sub 2 SO4. So now this is A, this is B, and this is C. Now, the B and C combine together in giving us sulfate. Okay? Separately. First of all, the B and C combine together in giving us a sulfate separately. B and C combine together in giving us sulfate separately. Remember, I talked about hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Now, B, A, B, and C. Now, B and C combine to give us sulfate first. B and C combine to give us sulfate first. Okay, now this particular proportion adding hydrogen, adding hydrogen, which is A, will give us a H subscript 2 SO subscript 4, will give us H subscript 2 SO4. Now, if you check, they say the A and B combine together. The A and B combine together, and the A and B, first of all, gave us a compound. First of all, before adding an element again, which is a hydrogen. Now, adding the hydrogen gives us sulfuric acid or tetraozosulfuric acid. Anyone want to call it? Now, that does not mean that because of both of them, first of all, reacted together, the weight will be different. They still give us a particular product, which is sulfuric acid. In essence, if you're going to weigh hydrogen, it is going to have the same weight of sulfur and oxygen. Why? Because you cannot separate them when you want to weigh them. If you want to weigh them, you now weigh them together. Why? Because they have been combined chemically and they formed a different uh, product. They've been combined together and they have formed a product. So in essence, if you want to weigh them, you can weigh them differently. So the same way that the B and C we have is the same way that the A we have. 
is the same weight that the B will have, it's the same weight that the C will have. It's not because they are separated, it, it is going to give you a separate uh, weight, no. Since they've come together and formed the compound, they are going to give you the same weight. So we've come to the end of this section, but before we go, we have to look at our exam guide to check some questions and see how it has quantified what we have learned. Now we'll go to our exam guide, year 2000, question 5. Question 5, it says, Electrovalent compounds are characterized by... I told you what electrovalent compounds are, okay? If you check, it says solubility in ethanol, no? High molar mass, no. High melting point and strong oxidizing ability. I told you electrovalent. Ele electro means electrons, valent means together. I told you that. In essence, the electro, the electro is talking about ions, electric charges coming together. And I told you that when they come together, they're going to have a high melting point because of their charges. Because of their charges. So they are being characterized by their high melting point. So the next question is 2018, 2018, question 40, question 40. It says the law of definite proportion states, pure sample of substances are in the same proportion by mass. Yes. Pure samples of substances are not in the same proportion by mass, no? Chemical compounds are pure because they contain the same element, no? Matter can either be created, nor destroyed, no? Now, I told you of definite proportion or constant composition. I told you that every single element that takes part in this reaction, in definite proportion, have the same proportion by mass. During the reaction, before the reaction, during the reaction, and even after the reaction. I give an example of water. Okay? Water is two before the reaction. Water is two during the reaction, and water is still two after the reaction. So they have the same proportion by mass. Even after the reaction, the hydrogen and oxygen came together, and they will have the same proportion by mass. So the, now, when they say pure samples, pure samples, I told you are pure substances. Okay? These samples are simply pure substances. You know that compounds and elements are pure substances. So they are talking about compounds. Okay? So the answer is pure samples of su substances are in the same proportion by mass. So the answer is A. The answer is A. Now the last one we are going to take for this exam guide is 2016. 2016 question 16. They said, if element X forms the following oxide, the phenomenon illustrates, we just talked about multiple proportion here, okay, where an element forms three different, where an element forms three compounds, where an element forms three compounds, multiple, multiple compounds. So in essence, as long as the element forms three different compounds, these two elements form three different compounds, that particular law that binds it is law of multiple proportion. Multiple means many, we know that. So these elements that come together form three different compounds, according to John Dalton, that gave us the law. Okay? These elements form three different uh, compounds. And if you check, the elements form three different compounds, the oxide, the oxygen, forms the first one, X of 3, 2, O, forms the second one, X, O, forms the third one, X, O, subscript 2. So in essence, the answer is law of multiple uh, proportion. Thank you for participating in today's class. You can practice more questions using the exam guide app. The app scores and gives a detailed explanation of all the questions at the end of your practice test. You can learn a particular topic of interest with different modes like study mode, mock mode, and practice mode. It also has other features that make learning fun. It is a must-have for all serious students. Download from www.examguide.com if you don't have it yet. See you in the next class. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hit the notification bell 
and share the videos to people that will benefit from it. Bye.